Hello, I'm John Cullum. In this evening's ABC Theater presentation of The Day After, I play a father in a typical American family who experienced the catastrophic events of a full-scale nuclear war. Before the movie begins, we would like to caution parents about the graphic depiction of nuclear explosions and their devastating effects. The emotional impact of these scenes may be unusually disturbing and we are therefore recommending that very young children not be permitted to watch. Hey everyone ever and welcome to 20th Century Popcast, the show where we try to understand the present while living in the past. My name is Tim Blevins. My co-host Bob is absent today and we as a society are on the brink. Shaky week folks, shaky past weekend here in the modern era of a man claiming to be president of a nation no longer united. Uh, scary. Things are scary, you know, um, here in 2018 and they are not without precedent. They are not entirely without a a point of reference. They aren't entirely unfamiliar. Um, they are being perceived, at least by, by me, with the mature eyes of midlife. But there is an emanating fear that I recognize, uh, a feeling that I have felt, you know, before, and one that has possibly been there my whole life, but definitely at varying uh, levels of panic. I guess it technically began in the 80s, one of the two um, decades we discuss on this show. The general basis of the show, the heart of it, is this fact that there are things from childhood, things from our past that, that, that follow us and, and, and build on and build up our, our adulthood. Pieces of pop culture that are more than pop psychology. And today, on today's show, I'm going to be getting a little heavy with one of these by revisiting the 1983 ABC TV movie, The Day After. Not to be confused with the 2004 movie where Emmy Rossum outruns uh, the, the cold. The Day After first aired on the night of November 20th, 1983. Um, TV movies were big business in the 1980s with programs like Shogun, V and America with a K, uh, running like cinematic features in prime time. The Day After was an ambitious one of these meant to portray what a nuclear strike on American soil uh, would be like. Prior to its debut, ABC, the, ne the network that was showing The Day After, aired uh, content warnings advising that the film contained graphic and horrific elements, as well as distributing pamphlets uh, discussing and preparing viewers for some of the more gruesome scenes. Uh, a phone line was set up to counsel uh, viewers stricken with fear from viewing the program, and schools, churches, and, and community groups formed discussion, uh, discussion groups both before and after its airing to basically, what, um, help, help people cope. Now, um, I didn't see it. I didn't, I didn't see the day after when it first aired. And I will admit, it was years before I finally viewed a VHS rental copy of the movie. But by the time I sat down to quiver and quake at its contents, I was already well-versed in pop research about the film's subject matter. You know, it was that thing that gripped my childhood, that non-paranoid paranoia of what could happen at the drop of a hat and the push of a button. Nuclear annihilation. It was real enough to convince me that I had to see this this thing, this day after movie. Um, it's just, again, following its initial airing, it, it was difficult to find. So I, I researched the movie the way I researched any great find before the internet. Uh, Sci-fi compendiums and TV encyclopedias, both available at the local public and school library. Um, the books didn't share many visuals of the film, but they gave a brief synopsis. Uh, some critical reviews of the times, and for the behind-the-scenes junkie in training I was, they IMD beat it with a complete cast and crew list. See, I, I used to devour credits from the first page of a Moon Knight comic to the final scrolling moments of, of Star Chaser. So in doing so, and in looking at these kind of things, these credits, you know, some names stuck. 
names I would recognize as they came to the forefront of other projects, and, and in the case of The Day After, I recognized the first and last names of its director in the name Nicholas Meyer. Now, Nicholas Meyer, you might know the name, uh, mainly because he directed a film called Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. I mean, he also co-wrote Star Trek IV, and I think co-wrote and directed Star Trek VI, but of course, that's the film I would now know Nicholas Meyer from. And actually, right about now, I am wishing this was a Star Trek II episode. Um, It's not, but... It's worth pointing out that Myers came on to Star Trek following the first film, Star Trek The Motion Picture. Now, I, I saw that one. I saw that movie at a theater, probably at age three. And I think, really like many in the audience, that I fell a, a, asleep. Uh, the, the motion picture isn't a bad picture. It's slow. It's model-driven, which is great. But I don't think it fulfills a lot of what people think of when they think Star Trek. You know, at least nowadays, anyways. Now, I imagine fans of Star Trek like Captain Kirk. And they like Captain Kirk, not because he's also prog rock melodic William Shatner, but because of his unconventional solution to the Karabashi Maru. I mean, I did. The the character was campy in the best way, you know, jumping into action with no net and armed only with a hard-on for green ladies. It wasn't the fourth wall wink of Han Solo or the all-American-ness, I'm told, was Flash Gordon. Uh, Captain Kirk was a rebel, a space rebel, and his crew trusted him so we could admire him. And that carried the original series, but as time passes, you know, actors age, and for them to re- uh, remain relatable, you have to put them into age-appropriate situations. In Rathacon, we see, perhaps for the first time, um, a fragile Kirk in the face of an inescapable horror. We see this grand space captain in the very mundane situation of regretting it's his birthday. He has a wonderful scene where uh, the eternally old Bones McCoy greets him in his quarters, bearing uh, the gift of an antique pair of of glasses and some illegal uh, Romulan ale. But the glasses, they are meant to acknowledge his own uh, fading vision. Kirk, Kirk is an older man, and despite whatever number warp drive Sulu is counting to, he can't escape the slow burn, horda-like reality of a body breaking down and that human aspect gives us something to hold on to in this giant space opera of flying starships and tings in our ears spectacle is great and heightened danger to the point of laser cannons and planet manipulating missiles is the thrilling heart of great sci-fi entertainment but sometimes wonderfully pulp potentially B-graded cinema can be elevated to um, an unexpected height and strike something at our own individual hearts registering within a human sensibility that is uh, personal and, 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 and intimate and far more uh, impactive. So that would actually be a pretty good podcast there, right? Exploring the human side of Kirk and his crew and Star Trek II. Plus, what's more optimistic than Star Trek? What, what, what piece of sci-fi parable lights this human spirit of success and accomplishment into a pyre of promise and, and, and possibility? Who hasn't found themselves inspired by the potential of people to finally manage all their differences and still work together towards a utopian society of science and wonder? Yes, I think that would be a great episode. But it's not actually the world we are currently living in. We're living in an age where Twitter wars could actually accelerate into a military strike. An era where nuclear proliferation is being placed back on uh, on the table. A time where two fashion-fatigued trolls who bullied their way into power are locked in a bad improv of your mama jokes that might actually wind up roasting an entire city's populace. This isn't a time of hope and prosperity, not when certain institutions of science and advancement are being as sloppily dismantled as a sophomore year IKEA shelf. These past 362 days have stoked a thermal fear I haven't felt since that last verse of We Didn't Start the Fire. 
And last Saturday, a part of this colonized world ducked and covered under what had to have been one of the most ill-fitting tweets since DiGiorno hashtagged why I stayed. Hawaii was under attack, imminent attack by incoming ballistic missiles. This was on social media, the same medium we rely on for designating friends and claiming a repost as activism. People's phones lit up with a government-sanctioned text that their surroundings would follow suit. Panic ensued. Shelter was taken, and, and, and for a brief moment of amplified eternity, scores of people braced for a scorched earth. The button had been pressed. The mutual destruction assured, and nuclear war had begun. And then... An Instagram post of someone claiming their two-year-old had chosen that Shea Rivera shirt themselves returned to my feed, and our third extinction was delayed. It was a false alarm, people. If you don't know what I'm talking about, congratulations on getting time travel to work forward. Hawaii wasn't decimated in a reign of retaliation, but for a series of minutes there, it must have felt like it was about to. This internal terror of a nuclear strike, a life-ending nightmare of atomizing mushrooms and environmental fallout, was the constant trepidation of my youth. It was on my mind, all the time, in varying levels of severity. You know, at its faintest, it was the backdrop of an alternative future, you know, a harrowing end to humanity that could be prevented by the sci-fi warnings of a wayward Reese or Shadow Cat. Or, you know, maybe it drew me to the geopolitical section of the school's library, you know, where I would scan hardback spines with titles like Nuclear War in the 1980s and Will Humanity Survive? But at its greatest, it weighed me down like a waking nightmare, occupying my every step and making me terrified to glance out at a horizon doomed to Sodom or Gomorrah. My parents were patient hearing out my somewhat uneducated but still somehow validated terror. And they would do what loving parents do when faced with such a massively incomprehensible scenario of humanity's lack of itself. They would tell me to go outside and play, to enjoy the day that you have, and to not worry about the unknown because it's just that, unknown. Hence, 42 years of anxiety about the future, but their intentions were with their hearts, which thankfully for my childhood were in the right place. Still, the visual terrors of nuclear war were splash paged across every issue of my youth. And it wasn't really until after the initial Gulf War that they subsided slightly, enough to make my first few forays into adolescent a bit more comforting. I think it's because in the early 90s, uh, that's when I discovered conspiracy theory and all these supposed texts of suppressed truth hinting at the fact that our government was working against us via alien liaisons and a super-secret MK Ultra project. It was the paranoid rhetoric of Art Bell, John Lear, and the entire editorial board of UFO Universe, and I ate it up because, one, aliens, and two... I had found a new end to humanity that didn't actually involve the instant flash incineration of my own flesh. It was Armageddon through subjugation, and the pop-punk alibi to that was you could always fight back. At least that was my fox molderized understanding of the whole thing. Also, a lot of those beliefs are just nuts. But a nuclear war is conceivable. It has been since this nation thought to strike first and twice in uh, 1945. The existence of such a weapon ensured other weapons would arise, nations wanting protection from other nations, and well, you know how that's all turned out. Nuclear arms exist. We've seen photos. We know where they are. They are tangible devices, and you don't devise a device without at least a minute intention of deploying it, so that's a real threat. And it was never more real to me, well, previously never more real, than the early to mid-era of the 1980s. It postmarked our post-apocalyptic literature, sorry pop filter, and corroded our TV screens with more than its fair share of what-if-we-wipe-out-society scenarios. And no televised event, 
was more of an, of an event than the 1983 Nicholas Meyer-directed TV movie that I briefly mentioned at the top of this manic monologue, The Day After. <sighs> this is already a rough one, and I don't think it's going to get any better as this podcast episode uh, progresses, mainly because I'm going to go watch it. I'm going to go watch The Day After. See, I'm doing a bit of a retro shock today. You know, going back to rewatch something from childhood, see how it impacts me in the here and limited now. Um, I have the movie on DVD uh, the day after. And, and, And the case for it is one that just somehow always happens to work its way into view. See, I keep my DVDs and, and Blu-ray arranged in some sort of intended order atop a shelving unit that allows like a side boob glimpse at what's on the edge. Um, Ex Machina currently glimpses out on top. The Ewoks Caravan of Courage designating the second shelf for all things Star Wars. And the third one down has something by David Lynch that my partner adores and I have yet to fully grasp. But right below it, fourth shelf down and one from the ground, I can see the sickening orange tint of the cover's mushroom cloud, the gag-reflected emoticon of the Manhattan Project's inevitable outcome. The image of a mushroom cloud immediately turns my stomach and eradicates any passing glimpse of comfort I may have been feeling. And it was so prevalent in my childhood culture that I probably glimpsed it somehow nearly every day. It's in comic books. It's on TV. It shows up in an episode of You Can't Do That on Television. It's rendered by words in pulpy sci-fi pop music and having studied a jiffy pop package for the reference it found its way into my own book cover doodles in elementary school so imagine how thrilled i must selfishly be that this formerly daily dose of terminal fear has found a way to occupy the current currency of my life thank fuck that feeling's back I don't know how I wouldn't get out of bed in the morning without it. This was a lot of the 80s for me. And I was happy to, at one time, uh, feel the security, as false as it may have been, that that obsession was no longer my obsession. And I could contemplate that simplicity of a secret crush being uncovered as being what ends my world. God, we were such self-absorbed blind mice in the 90s. Thanks, current Cold War climate for swatting any remnants of college-age confidence out of my slightly bloated system. The day after terrified me the first time I saw it in full. So much that after the inevitable nuclear strike that it was promoted as depicting occurred, I immediately stopped the tape. Sat staring at whatever channel had been displaying its garbage prior to my mind numbing, and then rewound a few minutes and rewatched the scene in horror again. This absolute, indescribable horror that ravaged a simple countryside within the limits of its budgetary special effects. A simple little small town, Midwest town, populated by sports-playing teenagers, 20-something fiancés, simple-minded folks working simple jobs, all in a surrounding that wasn't the New England environment I was familiar with, but did echo the small town vibe I was part of. And this is why I mentioned Nicholas Meyer and his work on Wrath of Khan. Because he hooked me in, god damn it, and got me involved by playing into or with or just addressing a very real reality within the grander, well not sci-fi, conceit of the film at large. He didn't set the Armageddon in a military bunker or a metropolitan, ah, metropolitan city I had yet visit is what I was trying to say. He scorched the countryside of an innocent and uninspiring small town, meaning that I wasn't hiding out from anything in the seemingly safe shelter of little Lebanon, Connecticut. We had a single stoplight in town and thousands of acres of unpopulated land. We were a rural village With an average graduating class of 62 kids, no one on a global scale should care about us, right? Fucking wrong. So, yeah, now I'm just stalling, putting off starting the countdown to zero hour when those missiles strike and those special effects turn gross and orange. 
polluting the screen with dust and debris, fire, and God, that awful weird special effect where frozen human figures become x-rayed skeletons standing in poses of sheer panic. Thanks, the day after. Thanks for that. Please, please tell me now. 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 Oh. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus, God. Um, something we always forget to do fucking do in these retro shocks um we have a little thing called good memory or bad memory and i gotta say uh day after you're <laughs> pretty bad memory and i don't mean bad like you weren't executed well that you weren't of a caliber of class or storytelling i just mean that this is a nuclear nightmare unlike any nuclear nightmare i've ever seen you scarred and charred me as a child before I even witnessed you and watched you. So, yeah, the memory of you... Fuck, the memory of you is... um, I mean, I guess we say good memory because you were impactive. You did what you are supposed to do. Jesus! I don't know what your regular day is is like when you have a free day. I don't know if you ever call in sick to work or or, or maybe it's a holiday or, or just a snow day, you know, and you can't get out of your house. But if you want to rapidly descend into a sensation of helplessness, loss, and just cringing, gripping your own fingers and squeezing them, wondering when these poor actors portraying people are going to find some salvation, go watch this. Go watch The Day After. I I would love to sit here right now in front of this microphone and Mystery Science Theater the whole thing, you know, because we've got a lot uh, to go on here. We've got Steve Gutenberg. We've got Stephen First. We've got John Lithgow. We've got actors that we can make fun of their prior work for, with, about... We have slight limitations of 80s special effects. We have a few remnants of 80s fashion, and I think I I glimpsed, you know, a prototype for Pizzeria Uno. So there are things, I guess, two hosts could make jokes about, but I'm going to tell you, man, this is not... This is not something you watched for a thrill. This is not something you watched to enjoy. This is a really well-made... TV movie that I don't know why you would watch it more than once. I can't imagine what it was like to make it, but it is it is a grotesserie uh, to make it through. And 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 I think it's I think there's two things going on. I think when it aired, I mean, I'm glad I didn't see this as a child. And I'm not normally one to censor things from kids. I'm not really, or I don't feel like I have the mindset that there are things kids should not see because they're not ready. You know, I I, I mean, I I think there's a, a spectrum of what kids can handle. And I'm sure you can make decisions if you're their parents and you know them well, or their brothers or sisters and you know them well, or their friends and you know them well. You, you, you. You make decisions. And I get that. And I understand that. I don't think it's across the board. My kid can only see PG movies. Anything rated R is awful. Because I, yeah, National Lampoon's is an R-rated movie, and that's fun, you know. And Gremlins is PG, and that's fun, but also horrendous. But I can't imagine a child asking to watch this. And, and I'll tell you, I, I put up on Twitter, and I put up on Instagram, and I put up on Facebook that I was going to watch this movie today. I, I, I kind of pushed it out there. And, and, and a couple people responded, I hope jokingly, I hope these were weird jokes, but just talking about how they saw it as a child or how their teachers showed it to them as a child. They showed this movie, the show children, the horrors of a nuclear war. And I'm normally all for that, you know. If you're going to preach something, you know, show the outcome, I guess. But, I mean, this isn't the, the juvenile ridiculousness of reefer madness. This isn't an 80s different stroke episode that attempts to poke and prod a social issue with a light laugh track touch and a light touch of Gordon Jump. This, this is a movie that I don't... 
And I guess I almost respect this. <laughs> this movie has no hope. This isn't a movie that's out there to make you think humanity can still make it. This is a movie that has pretty much decided that an imminent nuclear war will decimate whatever hope is left. And that's an important statement and a powerful one. And I'm sure what it aired on TV, one that was difficult to rectify or whatever the word is I'm looking for with your sponsors and, and with viewers and, and just with the network itself. I admire the ABC network for putting their name on this and allowing it to be made. I mean, don't get me wrong, the filmmakers and everyone who actually made it deserve the, most of the admiration for what they did. Because I'll be honest with you, this is a harrowing, frightening movie that doesn't really fall to camp. I mean, you could make jokes about it, sure. And I made a few out loud by myself at the beginning when I was sucking down drinks and chewing on a Reese's peanut butter cup. God, this, this nuclear holocaust drove me back to sugar. There was 7-Up in my drink. But, um... I don't know. I mean, TV movies play to a certain predictability, I think. I mean, you, and, and I guess this movie sets it up. There's a couple who's going to get married. There's a couple who are talking about, well, could it happen? I don't know if it could happen. Someone's a doctor. There's, you know, there's, there's a little character storyline, sure, that gets set up like any TV movie. But all of these storylines, I'm going to keep using this word because the more horrendous words involve flesh burning and people turning to ash. These storylines and characters' plots get decimated. And the sickening orange, no holds barred effects of nuclear attacks. So I can see why this movie terrified an audience. I see why there were support groups. I get why people were at a loss after the movie. And I can't, I'm, I'm watching, I watched this partially in daylight, then it got darker. I watched this in the afternoon. I watched this also knowing what happened because I'd seen it before and knowing that I would get to a microphone and talk about it. I don't know in the era of the 1980s what it would have been like. Because like, I think my parents watched this. I think they did. And I, and I almost can't imagine them getting through it. But I also, I know them and I know if something is really difficult for them, they push through and watch it because they're invested and they just want to see how does this turn out. You know, I, I've... I've they did it with Breaking Bad. Um, we did it when we watched Strange Days. I mean, they do it. So if they're sitting there watching this movie, I, I, I think you would just keep looking to your loved ones at a loss. Because you expect something from a disaster movie. If a movie is a nuclear attack movie, you expect there to be an attack. So I get it. But the attack comes maybe in the first, I don't know, before the first half of the movie. And after that is really what's relentless as these people's lives fall out like hair while you see humanity degrade, while you see some people bunkered down in a situation where it feels like, okay, so the worst has passed, right? No. These people step outside and, and they're absorbing radiation and the movie follows them along as they weaken, as they get battered, as, 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 as just nuclear fallout befalls them. And that's what this movie does. It's not a special effect spectacular showing you cartoony explosions or big screen bonanza effects. It's there. And that nuclear strike scene, yeah, it's disturbing. It's also pieced together with pre-existing footage. I mean, there's nuclear test footage put in there uh, amongst the green screen mushroom clouds. And I think there's footage from an earthquake 70s disaster movie. And I read there's even footage from one of the Superman movies in there. So... You know, it's it's sewn together, and I wish that that offered some comfort, and I could laugh at that fact, but the majority of this movie is how the survivors of a nuclear war don't survive. And that's never been my fear. I guess, you know, it's weird. In that sense, the movie plays off a different fear, because growing up, and now, the fear is the attack itself. And even sitting down to watch this movie today, the anticipation was the attack scene was coming. And, you know, I felt my grip or, you know, on, the, on whatever I was gripping tightened. That's a dumb analogy, but it's fine. What I'm saying is I felt the anxiety as the scene was approaching. And then I also couldn't quite place when the scene hits. Because the movie builds up in, in, in such a blasé way. There, the movie starts, I think there's already military tensions in the world. And again, as a knowledge of 80s world politics and world placements would be required to fully 
explain the start of this film, so I'm not the one doing that, apparently, because I don't have that. But at the start of the movie, there's already tensions somewhere, I think, on the German border. And, the, and, and you get this because you see news, you see TVs on in the background and people watching the news. You hear snippets of the radio as other scenes play out, and they're talking about a NATO conflict. They're talking about a Russian conflict. They're talking about heightened tensions. And the characters are hearing it throughout their daily lives and some are focused and they start to pay attention to it others go about their flirty business while it happens some and then you, know, you get a little conversation i guess this is the once tv movie thing you get a, an older couple who remembers the cuban missile crisis you know reacting to the news and saying do you remember that and, and remember how that turned out to give us some semblance of uh, a historical context or, or 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 just you know where we are placement um in the world but again, it's just audio. It's just news reports. We're not seeing footage of troops being deployed. We're not seeing footage of apparent airstrikes. And this maybe plays to also just how news was delivered in the 80s versus now. There is a war brewing at the very start of this movie. And there are nuclear strikes that occur before the missiles that hit uh, the U.S. And we see none of this. We get none of this we're, 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 in visual. We get people talking about uncorroborated reports. In this, you know, we get people in the small southern town tuning to the news and seeing different uh, anchors, news anchors, uh, saying, you know, we have unconfirmed reports of a device being detonated. So we don't know the weight of this event. We don't know the weight of it until really until air raid sirens begin and because we're in this small Kansas town missiles start to be launched and I didn't grow up near a missile silo thankfully I guess growing up in New England what you can you can grow up near the naval base the the nuclear sub base and you can grow up near nuclear reactors so there you're, you're, there are targets you'd be in the proximity of but I as far as I know there are no underground missile silos so that as a setting is strange to me, but but the whole towns, whole parts of the Midwest are built around and near and maybe even over missile silos where these giant rockets tipped with nuclear warheads sit dormant in their cave, just hibernating and ho- for a hopeful eternity. But as this movie demonstrated, no. So there's a there's an armada of earth destroying weaponry under this rural town where people bike where they're going where football is a big deal and 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 i don't know just where people want to get out kansas city missouri i mean i've I've driven through the midwest i've never lived there but it to me in a closed-minded new englander fashion it feels desolate it feels isolated it feels empty but it also feels distant from the rest of the world like who in the world, and this sounds horrible, I apologize, but who in the world gives a fuck about Missouri or cares for Kansas or, or, or would consider the Midwest? Tornadoes might blow through there, sure. Cattle mutilations, of course, but no one's thinking of these areas as a target, right? I mean, Russia doesn't know they exist, correct? No, they do, and they're targets for the very basis that in this film, They're designated prime targets for attack because of the nature of the fact that they have nuclear armaments resting beneath their topsoil. And that is frightening because it turns the world at large, but this country in particular, into a a, a place where there's no safety zone. You know, I again, I grew up in a small town in Connecticut, and so for all my fears and all my terrors, there was always this voice that's of someone this comforting voice saying but it would never reach us you know there was this idea that we weren't in an area that got tornadoes that got earthquakes that got cattle mutilations or bigfoot or gang fights or any of these things that i feared for and yet this rural town in the midwest obliterated in the film by nuclear attack attack that we don't see coming because the movie doesn't tell you how the war starts the movie is very vague on who fired first there's even a conversation about it but they never tell you we or they launched it we being america sorry rah 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 whatever jingoism but it's never clearly stated the world is at a loss and that's how the news is bringing it to these people in the midwest and that blew my mind 
that makes it terrifying too but that blew my mind that in an era that's i guess 30 years ago but it doesn't seem that long ago that the world could be that much in the dark i mean would we now with our access to the internet and our access to around the clock cable news and our cell phones you know the story would go differently i think but that something like this could accelerate so quickly, and it does. It happens, I believe, over the course of a night before the strike, that the world could not know. I mean, I'm just viewing it. You know, again, I know it's fictional. I know it's a movie. I know one of these actors was in three of the many police academies. But I'm watching it, and I know what's supposed to happen, and I still don't know when to expect the strike. You know, there's a little forethought from having viewing it before, but it really does come out of the blue. People are driving. People are going about their day. People are at school. People are just, you know, some people are preparing for the worst and building their bunkers, but people are still going about their day when suddenly there's a flash. That's the other thing. It's not an incoming missile. It's a flash. The flash above ground. Some people watch it. Some don't. People cover their eyes. A mushroom cloud forms. And then... The havoc commences and in weird ways almost like a almost like a storm you know almost like a rainstorm it spreads out you know it's hard to tell who's where who's safe because a nuclear explosion apparently happens above ground above the ground and then topples down like a pillar of fire and this movie gets that right i'm saying gets it right i really don't know because that's the thing my fear of the nuclear destruction to this day is partially resting in the unknown i mean i've done some research i've read some books i actually have a small library of books that i've read about nuclear deterrence the possibility of nuclear war close calls in the past how are nuclear security supposedly work and stuff just to read it but i really don't know the science because i'm too scared to read of the physics and the science of how one of these devices works how it impacts carbon how and what happens to an organic individual in its proximity it's horrifying the closest i've come to reading about it is is in reading about hiroshima and, and the day after of that bomb and so i guess some of this ever-present fear of mine some of this constant as a child and now returning malaise this shroud that will muffle a little bit of joy here and there that is nuclear war comes from that unknown because honestly i get fearing death we all do and I'm, i think we all i think we all die very afraid you know we probably die terrified and maybe screaming I'm not looking forward to it. I'm not looking forward to witnessing it, you know, through pets and, and friends and family. And chances are I will, all of those things. But I get that we do die. Again, I don't know how, but I understand how a disease can take someone. You know, I understand how a bullet, unfortunately, works, how a car crash works, how certain things work. But a nuclear weapon and the magnitude of that, and then, you know, to, to exponentially build on that nuclear war was too big of a concept for me as a child. I couldn't grasp it because, thankfully, I never witnessed it. I mean, maybe people during war, World War II had a sense of it, but in the mid-'80s, I mean, I was, I was born after Vietnam. Uh, the military strikes of the 80s were not something I was aware of. The Gulf War in 19, what was that, 1991? 90 or 91? 91, I think. That was the first military excursion I was aware of, and I was terrified of it. And when I look at it now, not that it's laughable because people did die, weapons did get deployed, money was spent, it was a war. But it was so min my miniature or, or, or tiny, you know, again, not in, 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 in its demise, but, but uh, in the demise of, of, of people in it. But, but just in terms of scope, it, it, it was still military action, which I think is awful, but it was limited. And so the scope of that was small, and that's all I knew. Jump ahead ten years, and and there's you know there's the attack on New York in the in the next century. But we're not really there. We're talking twentieth century, I guess. So in the eighties, having not witnessed a war, living in my small town, living in some ways an isolated life from some of the pains of the world because of parents that care and because of having a backyard that was wide, I guess, and, and because of liking being inside more than out. Um, I didn't have the exposure to terror. 
And so I think to grasp that, to try to grasp that, to try to, to manifest that, to try to, to, to understand horror, it went to almost comic book proportions, epic proportion, Death Star at Alderaan proportions. Nuclear war, the concept was so, and I don't mean this in the ups, up-sounding way of the word. It was so fantastic in the sense of not, yay, rah, fantastic beasts, but massively terrifying. Awesome in the sense of it struck unfortunate awe into me. It was so big because the understanding was total decimation. And that's not a scale I can understand now, let alone as a 10-year-old, seven when this aired, six or seven. So nuclear war was the specific fear of mine and in a lot of ways encapsulated all the fears of the unknown I had. Things that were too big for me, you know. Down the line, what's too big for me? Well, leaving home to live in the city was probably too big for me. Confessing my feelings to someone who may not reciprocate it was probably big for me. The few times I got up on a stage to deliver a stand-up monologue was probably too big for me. Those things were terrifying and tiny comparatively, but terrifying. And I either hadn't approached them yet at, at the age I was at or when I did, they were too personal and too immediate that to freeze in the face of that seemed weak and cowardly. But having the same paralysis in the face of something that you would hope to never face, never see, but was just too much to grasp. I mean, that was the nuclear armament question to me. That was news reports on nuclear weapons. That was this movie. Because it was a massive, massive unknown. And again, I don't think it's good <laughs> for a child to watch, but maybe as an adult, maybe it's important. And, and again, good is weird because, you know, when I get to the point, maybe I'll do it now when I say, is this movie a good reality or a bad reality? And I know I'm not talking about this the way I normally talk about it. God, this is kind of a downer episode. I'm sorry. I, I just, in sharing what's on my mind here and trying to like, show is I guess the truth is that I'm scared I'm scared for the toxicity of leaders who think they can banter about weapons in wording and I worry what happens when the first one decides to go the extra step of hitting the button and I'm worried that we're just as much again I say I always say we when I refer to this country because we're in it we're, we, I am an American by default so we but that this country, because of its possession of these weapon trees and its recent upswing and threatening to use them, we're the villains to the world, you know? North Korea is the villain to the world if it's threatening to use its armaments. We're doing the same thing. And it's terrifying because I don't know if that's what the 80s were like. I don't quite remember Reagan's speeches in the sense of I mean was he bragging about the weapons we had had he before he was president ever asked a question why don't we use nuclear weapons because a current leader of this country did he did ask that prior to uh, winning uh, the election of this country over a year ago so <sighs> I'm scared because I don't know if that many weapons of massive, massive destruction have ever been under the umbrella of command of such a spiteful, hating, fascist lunatic. Someone whose ego takes precedent over the country and someone who needs to be looked on as a celebrity, not as a president. You know, Ronald Reagan was an actor first, I know him as president, but apparently he was an actor. So I don't know where the same things level against him, maybe. But we have someone in the White House who likes the machinations of TV, the big ratings, the spectacle. That's how The Apprentice worked. That's probably how a lot of his favorite shows work. And he dives into Twitter, the medium of Twitter, the same way. Get him with the one-hit sentences here and there. Shoot him off, you know, build to, to a punchline. 
and, and let the masses bathe in that because it's his personality. Twitter is a personality. It's the fucking president's personality and it's supposedly speaking for the country. So I'm scared, terrified because that personality, the guy who loved saying you're fired, the guy whose show required the tension to continue, the guy whose television show was not about bettering the world, but was about being the cutthroat host. I mean, that's the gist of Donald Trump on The Apprentice. And it's Donald Trump in the White House. He's not a, playing a different character. It's just kind of like when the kids on Facts of Life are too old for college, then they move them to working in a store together. That's all he's done. He's changed the background of his ridiculous program. And his mindset hasn't changed, so he, 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 he would throw a missile. That's the thing. That's what's scary. He would throw it, and he's locked in a battle of words with someone who I think would share that sensibility. And so to watch a movie like The Day After, set in a time where, look, Ronald Reagan is no hero. He's no saint. He was, he was, it did some atrocious military actions and really didn't care for a lot of human rights, but there were different kinds of celebrities. And in that era, if a movie like The Day After, which originally was intended to, to, I think, take place under the Reagan White House, I believe originally the president's voice at the end of the movie was a Reagan impersonator. And I think they changed it in subsequent viewings because it was a little laughable. But if that movie was intended to take place during then, during the reign of a president that is considerably more sane, even as his dementia set in, than our current one, then yes, I fear for if that was a realistic portrayal, as I believe it's been presented as, we're closer now. You know, and it's it's that suspension and unknown of what of how fast and when it will happen. You know, disease is scary, but I get how someone gets disease, and I know it'll happen. A car accident, yes, that is scary, but 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 the, the the magnitude of something like this, a nuclear strike, in either direction, to live in the country that launched it, or to live in the country that was struck by it, they turn into both. By the way, <sighs> there's a a fear to that, that this movie illustrates because it could happen at any time unknown out of the blue because they're weapons falling from the sky and they're weapons of prolonged mass destruction and the fallout, the after effects linger so I guess the day after to try to close this off because God, it's going down a depressing path I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Bob will be back next week we're, 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 we'll probably talk about bands of the 90s it'll be fun, you know or maybe bands of the 80s yeah, who knows? Billy Joel? Maybe we'll talk about Billy Joel. But this week, right now, the day after, and its presence on my video shelf now, but its presence as a film, as a child, was just this large unknown. A TV movie that I was told was terrifying. And I just got glimpses of it here and there. Read about it in a book. Heard a joke about it. There's a Bloom County cartoon that came out, I think it was time to come out around the same time as three panels. But the way it was published in the collection where I first saw it was, it's four panels, I'm sorry, Bloom County is always four panels? I think so. Um, however many panels Bloom County is, it was published in the book one less. The very last one of the collection, it's got the caption saying, the day after tomorrow aired on ABC last night, and it shows Binky waking up looking really shook up, and he's walking out of his bedroom, and I think the caption is saying, are you okay, sir, are you all right? And he just keeps walking outside, walks out his door and then normally there'd be the last panel there in the collection I had you flip the page over and the last page is this glorious drawing of Dawn and the dandelion patch and Opus and Binkley I think it's Opus and Binkley are both there trying to sigh a breath of, breath of relief in the aftermath of the horrible nightmare that was the previous night's film but those first couple panels that's the feeling that's what this thing is. It's the uncertainty. Where are you going? What's the feeling? What's wrong? What's next? And when? And that's, you know, that was my exposure to the day after. Until I saw it, it was just this idea that this movie is too horrible for human eyes and it'll melt them in your skull. Is it a good reality or a bad reality? I mean, I guess it's a good reality. 
because it's an impactive movie that doesn't fuck around and doesn't apologize. And look, I, I think we, I need to experience those feelings. I need to have an outlet in a venue. And if I can't get that in conversations, because truthfully, and I get it, by the way, I get if this episode isn't, isn't your, your thing. Why would it be? It's depressing. And people don't always know or know how or want to talk about this. So if I can't get that conversation with someone selfishly to the level that I need of, of, of demanding humanity is not demanding, but claiming the humanity is going to end itself. I need a movie like this. I need a terror like this. I need some way to nearly manageably experience that which I can't understand. And somehow the filmmakers of the day after did it. They gave us nothing but shock and terror for two hours. And I don't know. I'm not going to feel well as soon as I turn off this microphone and start editing the episode. I'm not going to feel well when this episode goes up because I feel bad that this is what I talked about. But at least I got to somehow unload and unleash in the privacy of viewing it through the horrors of effects and through the sadness of the story. At least experience something to understand why it frightens me so. I'm, I have a constant fear of nuclear war because of its massive unknown reality and every now and then and I'm, I'm not saying i'll ever go back to this film but every now and then having a touch point to touch on that something like this film yeah we need that i need that thank god these feelings are back huh fuck you ah the U, by the way, is the military complex of nuclear weapons. And I know it's a simplistic statement that I made, but Jesus Christ, really? <sighs> right back where I was in the 80s. Hey, the 80s, right? Thumbs up, sunglasses pulled halfway down. Hey, this suit jacket doesn't go all the way beneath my elbows. I'm trying to wrap the show up. Sorry, people. This was a downer, a real downer. But next week, an upper. Really, I'm going to switch the pills because I think it'll help. But also, Bob will be back. Back to what, you ask? Well, back to the normal kind of feeling format of 20th Century Popcast. This podcast, which, minus this episode, you enjoy, right? I think you might want to. Look, if you do enjoy it, visit 20popcast.com. God, I can't believe I'm promoting it after that conversation. Is anyone out there? Is there anyone left? If so, visit 20popcast.com. Oh, but the EMP knocked out my wireless. Oh, no, I gotta use my minutes. Look, 20th Century Pop is a podcast. We'll be back next week. In the interim, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Subcultish. You can follow the co host that you're really missing right now, Bob Canning, at RH Canning. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Subcultist. You can like us on Facebook. You can duck and cover and kiss your ass goodbye because the nuclear end is near. And hey, next week, again, we're probably talking about what? Better than Ezra, maybe? Sure. Ah, oh, terrified catchphrase. One millisecond takes you beyond imagining, beyond tomorrow, and into the day after. Over 300 missiles inbound now. Perhaps the most important film ever made. <laughs> the day after, 8.30 Sunday on Channel 10. Another Toyota Super Show.